unsuspecting ear hears terms such as regenerative farming or carbon sequestration, it's easy to think, oh, that sounds great. In this episode, we learn that carbon farming turns out to be yet another attempt to get us to applaud, and in many cases, even fund the further pursuit of planetary destruction. You said carbon sequestering, and it's being presented like it's a great solution to some environmental problems, but I don't know what that word means. The, the farmers have come up with this term carbon farming and regenerative ranching where they try to say, well, we're storing more carbon in the soils with our cattle grazing or goat grazing or sheep grazing. And what they're actually doing is saying, well, we um, put manure back on the land. But what that really means for like a dairy like here, that means like gigantic amounts of liquefied slurry manure that's like someone's septic tank that they then spray or spread or dump onto these fields. Hold on, say what? This calls for a moment of enlightenment. Because when I learned about this for the first time, it was hard for me to believe. But here it is. When trying to imagine the amount of cattle waste produced in the national seashore, first you need to picture the poop that is falling directly from the cattle themselves to the ground or in the ponds where the cattle are grazing. But in addition, you then need to think about the shocking amount of waste being produced in their holding pens and at their designated feeding areas, which is then collected, liquefied, or dried, and then spread in addition to all the other cattle waste already in the seashore. The land and water here are saturated with shit, making the idea that what is needed here is more shit a complete joke. Especially once an ecologist explains to you how carbon sequestration works with the root system of a native plant compared to that of an annual invasive. Okay, sorry about that. Let's resume. And it's, it doesn't absorb down into the ground. It doesn't, if manure is the carbon, it doesn't sequester down into the ground because of the cattle grazing has trampled and denuded the land, there's too much bare soil, and so all that manure runs off into the ocean, basically, and pollutes you, the water. You need plants to help that carbon right. get down. Right, Just right. Just leaving it on the surface, it, it doesn't take care of the process by itself. Right. If we walk around on a cattle grazed area, you'll see the soil is compacted. If we walk around in the native coastal prairie here, the soil is spongy and deep, and the roots go down three to six feet. And so when a rain comes, um, the rainwater actually goes down into the spongy soil instead of running off. But I see, this looks like there's plants everywhere. But if you walk out into these cattle pastures that have been mowed, it's basically stuff like this. Little, tiny, and here are the roots of it. These are the introduced, these might be brome grasses. That's the extent of the roots. These are little annual grasses that live a season, a spring, and then they die. The deep-rooted native perennial grasses uh, are living for 100 years, 200 years, and their roots go down deep into the soil. So we're dumping manure here and then saying that these roots are going to solve the problem of getting that down deep into the earth. And that's not going to work. That's correct, but it won't work. These are just, this, the roots are not going to hold the soil together and the soil compaction means manure will run off and not absorb. Let's compare it to a native plant. What have you found? So this is a native coastal prairie grass. It's um, Nootka reed grass. And this thing might be 200, 500 years old, but I'm gonna try to pull it up here. And you cannot, this, you need a bulldozer or you know a team of oxen. So this is what sequestering carbon. Look at the, how tall the foliage is, and the roots probably go down six feet here. Six so, feet? Six feet. And then look at this. Oh my gosh, this is biological soil crust. These are little lichens coming up, and that's moss. So there's all sorts of uh, mycorrhizal fungi that also go down. Here's moss. Look at these little fungi. This is really diverse. This cannot stand being trampled by 1,200 foot cattle hooves. 
Here's a, a lichen coming up from the soil. There's moss. This is actually great. You don't see this on the cattle pastures. How would this react to, I mean, manure? I was raised to think of manure as a great thing. That's what you use if you want your plants to grow. This is like a miniature rainforest. It takes in the fog and the rain. If you dumped manure on it, A, it would smother it, suffocate it, and a lot of it would just run off because you're trampling it with cows too. I mean, cows, this is not in cattle pasture. I've never seen this in one of the cattle pastures here. This is, it's like a, if you go to a cloud forest in the tropics, this is what this is like, very delicate. But the mycorrhizal fibers, roots, go down into the soil and they interact with the roots of this native bunch grass. Okay, you obviously know what you're talking about for <laughs> the people walking at home. Walk us through mycorrhizal. What, what word did you just use? Mycorrhizal, which means the fibers of mushrooms. Myco is like fungi. So we're talking about little, you can't see any, these might be little mushrooms. I think they're lichen, but so microscopic threads of mushroom roots is what we're talking about. And, but they also interact with lichens, blue-green algae, moss, and this is all together called biological soil crust. Biological like a, soil crust. Right. It's like a crust on the soil surface, but the secret is all this, the roots of all these delicate plants and lichens go down and mushrooms go down deep into the soil too. I'm glad you brought this up because I was just thinking to myself the other day, it's easy for us to recognize how a bird might use the brush, but it starts at a much smaller uh, organismal level than that. Right. And are we looking at the beginning right here? We're looking at the beginning. This is like an amazing, like a, a living soil. And this is where the carbon is really sequestered. There's scientific papers that show this and dumping manure on top of this, that's not carbon farming. Carbon farming is leaving this alone and letting elk and deer softly tread by. Okay, elk and deer softly tread by. They're big, they have hooves. Why is that so different than a cow going by? An elk probably weighs 400, maybe 600 pounds with kind of small cloven hooves. A dairy cow around here weighs, what, 1,500 pounds, 1,200 minimum, and they're designed to bred to just plant themselves and chew and trample, stand there, urinate, dump manure. Elk, being wild animals, are their behavior is to wander. They like to wander in small herds and keep moving. So they don't spend a lot of time in one spot. Right. And especially if we could restore Point Reyes without all the fences and barbed wire, we could really free up a, a large migratory movement of native Thule elk herds. So the fences are actually preventing wild animals from behaving the way that they would normally behave. Right, and it also concentrates these cattle herds right in one spot and really hammers this type of like living soil. But nevertheless, a 400 pound animal coming through here how does that not damage this? Because they don't spend a lot of time right in the same area trampling, especially if you don't have fences. So, I mean, this biological soil crust has been here for thousands of years with Thule elk. I mean, there's reports of Thule elk herds and um, Point Reyes right up until 1872, and then they were displaced by the ranches. So these are co-evolved with Thule elk and heavy cattle that are designed to stay in one pasture are not. So even if we don't understand it, the bottom line is that these plants and those animals lived here together and they worked it out. That's somehow. right, that's right, yeah. And if we can restore that and then let them be a little bit more, then I think this, it would be a lot better picture than what we see today with cows. This is like, this is the sponginess. This is carbon farming, or this is carbon sequestration. So, so small plants can be an effective part of carbon sequestration. Small plants are the main part of carbon sequestration because the density of roots that goes down deep into the soil layers here, several feet, this is what stores carbon. 
and leaving this intact is what is going to really store carbon long term. And this is very difficult to restore. This is probably hundreds and hundreds of years old. And if this were to be trampled and removed by cows, it would take, I mean, there are some research papers saying it would take 100 years to just start to replace this. This so is a mossy cover here. It's incorrect for me to point at a big tree and think of its root system and associate that with more carbon sequestration. Then. It's not incorrect, but it's, people say plant a tree and that's what we're gonna do to, um, you know, save the world, but actually leaving grasslands and these, the mosses, the biological soil crusts may do more, may do even more than a single woody root that goes down. I mean, this is like several square yards of soil that goes down quite deeply with the mycorrhizal filaments that are weaving through the soil. And this holds the soil intact from erosion and, um, dust storms i mean a lot of cattle pastures are just full of dust storms when it's windy because there's a lot of loose soil that's disturbed but look at this there's this is a moist no dust here carbon farming i guess you could say is sort of a subset of um conservation grazing quote unquote because that's the big uh, catchword that people are using, ranchers are using now, especially in the Bay Area, to say that they are conserving wildlife and rare species, they're sequestering carbon, they're fighting climate change, they're preserving water quality. And the more I go out to Point Reyes, the more you see that they're just completely, this is not accurate. So this is a really detailed drawing I did after Skylar and I found that beautiful biological soil crust. And I'll break this down because it's kind of like a cartoon, but it's a little detailed, but it's three different phases of the destruction of the original coastal prairie and elk ecosystem. So the top part drawing here is, say this is a thousand years ago. This is the coastal prairie. These are the native bunch grasses that we just found. And if you were to see under the soil, they do go down like five to six feet, the roots. And they're perennial forbs. There's coyote brush with deep roots. Elk would wander through, graze lightly. But if you were to look closer, this little box in the upper right, these are all the filaments and the mycorrhizae and the roots of mosses and um, this forms a symbiosis with the grass roots and shrub roots and tree roots. So they're actually interconnected. It's like the soil internet. And when you go down to the middle drawing here, this is the beginning of the destruction of the coastal prairie. So this probably happened in Point Reyes in the late 1800s, early 1900s. They just concentrated these heavy cows and fenced them in. And unlike elk, who probably were even migrated out of the Point Reyes Peninsula a lot seasonally and then came back in, when you add these fenced pastures, the cows are just trampling and grazing down these lush, juicy ice cream plants, the native plants. So when you destroy the above ground leaves of native plants, the roots begin to die too. So that's what we have here. And then when the roots die, the biological soil crust that's interconnected with it dies too. So then at the bottom, and we'll show you photographs of this, this is the situation today at Point Reyes. You have completely dead soil. You have these annual weeds like milk thistle and poison hemlock. You have manure just sitting on the ground. It's very compacted, dead soil. So this is kind of a, after several field trips and some research, this is sort of my summary of what's going on. And But this is conservation grazing. These are organic dairies. This is grass-fed beef, we're told. So to repeat some of the slides that I showed in my original presentation, just because I think it's worth repeating, Here's a painting I did of 
This is actually San Francisco looking wet or eastward towards Berkeley, Oakland Hills. Here's the coastal prairie with those deep rooted bunch grasses. There were shrubs um, scattered. So this is the way it used to look. So just picture that. Here's Central Valley elk herds, more bunch grasses. You had grizzly bears that were pretty much chasing the elk around too. That's something we don't even talk about. Wolves are native, grizzlies. So elk weren't just sitting in one place. They were actually kind of having to watch out for predators. Coastal prairie remnant that we found in an ungrazed pasture edge on L Ranch Road. And it's just, look at this, 100% ground cover native flowers that you don't see in the grazed areas. This is actually Idaho fescue, red fescue, and there's some other native grasses. Here's a star tulip and a big Idaho fescue bunch that are coastal adapted in California. And here's some snapshots of the same video uh, on our discovery of this beautiful biological soil crust growing around this Pacific reed grass bunch. And I added some more detail so you can really take a look. This is a moss in the green area. And then this is a, what's called a fruticose lichen. It's like a little cup on a stem. And I had not seen this in a grassland before because it's so hard to find ungrazed grasslands with native bunch grasses. Here's a picture of this, another lichen that I've never seen it. It was like inches tall and it just, probably collects the fog drip and the rain, and um, you don't see this in grazed cattle pastures. Here's a coating of moss around a bunch grass, and here's a mushroom. So there's quite a lot going on under the soil, and the mushrooms are actually the fruiting bodies of all this mycorrhizal networks going on under the ground. So again, this is what's really storing carbon. So the best carbon storage method in my mind is leave this alone and don't graze it with cows. Here's another picture of an ungrazed, this is like a wet seep with bunch grasses and rushes. And it, it was like a yard tall to wade through this. So just imagine putting your 1200 pound, I think the dairy bowls are 2000 pounds and fencing them in to this little area and it just crushes and destroys this. So, I mean, to go through this again, this is the original carbon sequestration. This soil is rich in living tissues, roots, the fibers of the mushrooms, moss roots, cattle come through. They're, these ecosystems are just not adapted to heavy herds of cattle put there year round concentrated with fences. So this results in a dead compacted soil topped with manure. Carbon poor actually. So I mean look at the difference. I mean this is a confined animal feeding operation so it's, it's the extreme but this is I mean completely the opposite end of the scale to that delicate coastal prairie we were seeing. And in the middle of the scale you think like Skylar said, this looks, oh, well, this is green. This is the cow pastures. Isn't this storing carbon? This is actually introduced. Everything here is introduced from Europe and Eurasia. Milk thistle, here's a radish. This is um, bare soil and poison hemlock coming up. This is like behind my photo here, but I think this is like rip gut brome and hair barley annual grasses from the Mediterranean region. And I think this is L Ranch, but you can see this yellow. This is actually a silage field that's been planted with mustard, radish, rye, barley. So they're doing more than just grazing things down. They're removing all vegetation and planting crops to feed the hungry dairy cows. And I'll go through these pretty quick because I had shown these earlier, but I mean, the Tule elk compared to dairy cows, just a much smaller animal compared to dairy cows. Here's ungrazed, actually tule elk grazed coastal prairie. And here's a cow pasture with a lot of bare ground, 
that's compacted down by heavy hooves. So it, rainwater tends to run off this much more in the cow pastures. And in the summer, the annual grasses only live in the winter and spring, and then they die. And then the cows eat the dead tiny annual grasses and you get like 80, 90% bare soil. I mean, this is atrociously overgrazed and I can't believe this is a national park, but it is, it's the seashore. Schuyler showed this, here's an elk hoof in a native prairie compared to a very large cow hoof, much different size. Here's a little elk scat that we found in the coastal prairie. They're like deer, they're just like big deer. And then here's a giant cow poop to compare. So you can see all of this um, degradation of removal of the deep rooted native bunch grasses and overgrazing by cows. It, begins year after year, decade after decade, it starts to take a toll on these grasslands and there's no roots or biological soil crusts now holding the soil together so you get erosion. This is called a head cut. This is in home ranch in the seashore and it's just soil beginning to cave in and run off into streams. And the trouble with doing that is these are streams where federally threatened coho salmon and steelhead trout need crystal clear, well oxygenated water. This is um, Golden Gate National Recreation Area um, in the pastoral zone. This is a grass-fed beef ranch, uh, tributary to Olima Creek. Horrendous erosion, bank destabilization, muddy waters. The park tried to mitigate it with these um, rolls of straw, and they actually planted ryegrass, domestic um, grain, which is not native, in a, a futile attempt to try to stabilize this soil. The best way would just be to remove the cows and start to really restore these areas. Here's water quality, um, just the amount of manure it produced by the dairy cows is monumental. And this is a, a organic dairy. Pictures of liquefied cow manure from the um, milker barns. Here's a pond right next to it, full of liquefied manure right along Kehoe Creek. This is Kehoe Creek, one of the most polluted water bodies in the country. So here's different methods that Photographers have gone out. We have some good friends who are anonymous who go out there and get these amazing pictures. This is all Point Reyes National Seashore. So this is carbon farming, um, according to the ranch industry or regenerative ranching. But when you look at it, it's just, there's too much manure and they don't have enough places to store it. So they just try to spread it. So this really impacts all these rare species, salmon, red-legged frogs, here's tricolored blackbirds, California freshwater shrimp, there are even native um, rare grasses. This is Sonoma alopecuris. So I'm gonna add some new pictures that you haven't seen yet of a ranch south of <clears throat> San Francisco. It's a private ranch that claims to do carbon farming, regenerative ranching, and conservation grazing. And this is not it. This is Point Reyes National Seashore. This is trampled, um, very short, grazed annual grasses. But several years ago, I was invited to the Tomcat Ranch in San Mateo County with my publisher, Malcolm Margolin. I probably wouldn't have got on here if it weren't for Malcolm Margolin, but who who um, knows what the Tomcat Ranch, who owns the Tomcat Ranch? It'll be interesting to see if anyone knows this. I'll tell you in a bit. So this is a private ranch and they're doing a better job of um, using cows to keep grass and carbon, but I'll tell you why. It's actually really difficult, very difficult. So this is a, one of their cattle pastures and there's a lot more grass. You can actually see the grass is taller. I did find a couple of native bunch grasses. Um, most of this is still annual bromes and hair barley and wild oats. So it's, it's better, 
But who owns this private ranch? I'll tell you in a bit. Here's a riparian area. They completely fence off the riparian areas in these willows and let no cattle graze them ever, which we don't see in Point Reyes. We're seeing cows in streams, trampling streams at Point Reyes. This is the Tomcat Ranch is owned by billionaire Tom Steyer and his wife, Cat. And so I was lucky enough, here's Cat Steyer. We got a tour of their operation and I learned a lot that you could possibly have a form of conservation grazing if you are rich and you can do everything right. And you, this is a hobby farm. She, Cat, is trying to test different methods of regenerative ranching on her private land. And I can see where you could maybe make some progress if you're a billionaire. Here's one of their pastures. One thing they do to keep these pastures pretty ungrazed, I mean, there's not a lot of grazed down grass, is they have a full-time crew of like a dozen range riders, cowboys, who continually herd the cows into a, like something like 15 or 20 small pastures. So it's a system called rotation grazing. And they keep herding them. And the idea is to imitate you know, wild animals migrating and moving through a land. Um, that takes a lot of effort. That takes a lot of, you've got to see if your cows are starting to graze too far. You've got to have a lot of pastures, a lot of fences with gates, and a lot of labor hired to keep herding them around these pastures. And then you can begin to maybe get some results. And she sells her grass-fed beef locally, um, but she doesn't have that many cows either. These are beef cows, and she has, her stocking rate is really low. I mean, there's, this is like a herd of, you know, a couple dozen on her thousands and thousands of acres. And so for most of the year, most of her ranch is not grazed at all. We don't see that on Point Reyes National Seashore. We see year-long grazing, very high stocking rates, which are completely unsustainable, where they have to truck in hay from the Central Valley. So here's Malcolm Margul and my publisher. So this is an example of, yeah, maybe you can do carbon farming. There was even a, a university study that went out and they didn't actually see that her ranch had a very high carbon content in the soil still. Um, she took it over and it was in pretty degraded situation. So it shows how even when you're doing everything right and you're a billionaire, it could take a hundred years to start really storing carbon in something like this. So that was really educational to see an example of possibly on the road to carbon storage and regenerative ranching, but we don't have that at Point Reyes at all. We have marginal ranchers trying to make a profit, barely making a profit, asking to diversify their ranchers with goats, hogs, chickens, Airbnbs, because they're not making a profit. And so they need to put more animals here and do more intensive um, commercial activities on these park lands. So, and in conclusion, this is the same slide I did in my original panel presentation. I mean, my idea would be to have no cows on Point Reyes National Seashore and have it restored fully to coastal prairie and tule elk. And then that would really store carbon over time. My name is Julie Phillips, I'm a Thule elk biologist, and I've been following and tracking the elk, studying the elk for over 30 years throughout much of their range in California. The Thule elk reserve is a captive elk herd, and to me that is inhumane in the 21st century. To have elk in a situation where they, they can't go free roaming across the landscape, they can't find possibly access to fresh water at times of the year, to, to disrupt the social behaviors of those complex herds, or subherds within that captive area 
is really not what we should be doing um, anywhere in California where the herds are, but especially in a national park like Point Reyes National Seashore. The tule elk form different subherds, and throughout much, much of the year, the cows are kind of off by themselves, the cows and calf groups, and then the bulls would be in groups. But then the rut season happens in the fall, and it gets really complex. So there'll be, usually be a dominant bull that's constantly being challenged by other bulls. There'll be the subordinate bulls that are off to the side that kind of follow the group. And then there's the cow-calf group that's monitored by this dominant bull. So it's a very dynamic situation. And in a captive setting, that becomes even more complex because animals simply can't shift. They can't shift within that range. So if you're a subordinate bull and you've got a dominant bull and you've got a captive area, to me, that dynamic becomes very complex. So what happens to a bull that's not, there's not enough water source, it's dried up, and sometimes in case, some of the cases it looks like in that captive area, they're almost like mud holes with very little free, you know, free flowing water. So then those dominant bulls could dominate that area and keep the other animals, males and females, away from those, especially in the fall, which is occurring right now at Point Reyes National Seashore. That's a very troublesome situation. I've just never seen wildlife drinking out of mud holes. In every place in the field, I've been in the different herds that we've studied, there's always free flowing water and those little riparian corridors. And what's important is not just the water, but the plants that grow along those little riparian corridors. The animals will feed that, they'll drink and feed, and they'll be shifting within that. So you have to have adequate water supplies. In some of the herds, there's huge lakes or reservoirs, and they're always nearby those, and they'll shift down to those. So you have to have regular water sources year round that aren't mud holes. First off, we don't have 5,000 elk at places like Point Reyes, like 700 and some, so that's a much smaller number separated into different groups. So to have 5,000 cattle is absolutely irresponsible. I mean, that's a lot of cattle in those pastoral lands. And obviously by the degraded nature of that landscape, that's some of the most degraded habitat I've ever seen in all my studies, and I've seen some pretty sad stuff. That is just terrible. So those animals and the cattle will just sit there and roam in that little area and just feed every ounce of it all the way down through the soil. So in those big perennial bunch grasses where they'll eat the, the stuff that's above the surface, they'll also go down and eat all the root structures below the surface. Whereas the elk will move, they're discriminate feeders, they'll kind of shift. They'll browse and, you know, woody stuff and then they'll, they'll keep moving through the areas. So as they shift, they don't take something until it's all the way down, they shift throughout the landscape. Yeah, the elk are constantly shifting within their range. So even over 20, I do 24 hour watches, they would be shifting throughout that time. They'd feed for a little while, graze and browse, and they'd shift. They'd lay down in an area and bed down for quite a while. And they'd get up and just kind of move. So it was a constant movement going on. They're, you're, they're not used to being confined. They need to be free roaming and they can move over a fairly large area. I would do 24 hour watches and I'd be out there sometimes for two or three days. And so then I would set up my equipment to kind of track them or so on and they would constantly be moving. So I'd have to load up my stuff, kind of pack stuff up again. If I was doing 24 hour watches during the night, I'd be moving at night even. So they would bed down for a few hours, but then all of a sudden I go, oh shoot, I'd have a night scope and they would be moving. So I'd have to pick up all my stuff and keep moving throughout that, you know, that period of time. So they're constantly moving and shifting across the landscape. And that's what they do, they're free roaming. The tule elk went from 500,000 tule elk in the state of California in their historic range down to probably less than 20. So it went through what's called a population bottleneck. We lost all those gene alleles. We lost all those elk. And so we lost that genetic diversity, those gene alleles. And then as the numbers slowly began to increase, you know, over a very long period of time from the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, so on, um, the elk were, different herds were established throughout the state. And then a group was put at Point Reyes of, what, 10 elk originally. And they were in a captive situation. So you've got the original elk that are put into a captive situation, and there's no um, ability to move out of that area. You're further causing stress to that species in terms of genetics by not allowing the movement of other animals within to, into that herd. So that causes further genetic gene allele concerns. We're worried about the genetic diversity because you don't have other animals coming into those groups. So they should be free roaming across the entire state, and they're not. But especially in a national park, 
If you're going to have two or three herds, you should allow them to move within those herds. So different males would move to different times of the year. They'd shift into different areas. So again, having a captive herd in a very small area that's gone year after year during the breeding season it doesn't seem responsible from a genetic perspective. You want to have new uh, males moving into those areas and other bulls able to shift out of those areas. The cow-calf group would also shift. The males may shift between different subherds. So elk dogs don't have one main herd. They often have many subherds. And in the larger areas, you would see the bulls shift to different areas you know, in response to the breeding season. The key to the long-term genetic health of the elk is to allow connectivity between the different herds, including Point Reyes National Seashore. So that means establishing herds um, outside the park that can be connected to the herds within Point Reyes. So maybe in you know, some of the sh lands adjacent to that would be incredible, but that's what really concerns me is there's no connectivity between the different herds. And you need to have that movement for the long-term genetic health of those populations. Well, just think of, think of an animal that's been captive for most of its life. Those little calves grow and eventually become bulls or cows. And then they suddenly get access to this freedom. And so they've lost kind of their social group, their social dynamics. So oftentimes in wild herds that are free roaming, the bulls will leave the herd, the cow-calf group, during the non-breeding season. And so for this group, they've all been kind of stuck there together in that captive setting. So it would seem like a bull that would get out of there would kind of think, okay, who's out here and what's going on? That would be quite complex. Especially now you've got, the other situation would be the pastoral, the pastoral lands with the ranchers. And who knows what's going on at night if they're being harassed or chased. Maybe he's confused because he ran into something at night. But you know, the dynamics of those groups in those pastoral lands must be very complex, especially the pressure they're under from people chasing them and so on. To me, I think they're being chased behind the scenes. See, and that's the other part that really is upsetting is that elk will not go out of their way to ruin a fence. The only time we've seen fences ruined is when the elk are driven into the fences, and that's often a practice used on public or private lands to kill the elk. They'll drive them, they'll actually chase them into the fences. They get caught in the fences, and they try to jump it and they get caught. I had one that flipped over the fence and got stuck in the barbed wire. So that's because they were being chased. So it's not natural for them um, unless they're being harassed. Point, Point Reyes National Seashore, first off, they should remove all the fencing and remove the cattle. But if that's not gonna happen, then they need to change all the fencing so it's all wildlife friendly fencing. So the elk can move through those areas and all other wildlife as well. So the elk are really kind of an indicator species for all the other wildlife. They're absolutely critical for all the other species to be able to move across that landscape. So to me, the cattle should be removed, all the fencing should be removed, and where there is fencing, it should be wildlife friendly fencing. But that captive elk herd should be released from that captive area immediately. And then again, the fences all removed. Barbed wire should be illegal in a national park. I cannot believe in the 21st century there's barbed wire and that kind of fencing in a national park. Obviously the cattle ranchers are driving that conversation. But again, they've outstayed their leases. They've outstayed, they've been paid to leave the land. Those pastoral lands are heavily degraded. It's time for a new focus and that would be to remove all the fencing where they need actual fencing for some reasons, and there would be, maybe there's habitat restoration they're gonna do, that would be wildlife, friends, uh, wildlife friendly fencing only. I think what's really important at Point Reyes is the restoration of that native landscape. And this could be a model for the state in terms of taking those pastoral lands, removing the cattle, and allowing the tule elk to go in and do their job. And that is to help restore the native perennial bunch grasses, the native annual grasses, the herbaceous forbs, the little non-woody plants, the shrubs, the oaks, let the oaks regenerate in those areas where they've been degraded and let the elk roam freely. And as they're doing that, they would help disperse those native plants and get rid of those non-native exotics. And that would be truly the most amazing example for people to study this whole concept of landscape ecology. And that's clearly what's missing from Point Reyes National Seashore. It's just devastated land, especially in the pastoral lands. And the elk should be allowed to roam free. They should be able to restore that landscape. They should be able to initiate their behavioral, you know, things that are more natural to the natural environment. This concept that the National Park Service and other ranchers and so on, they're putting out the regenerative ranching, that cattle restore the native landscape is irresponsible and just simply not true. And I'm being on many different ranches, including national monument lands, private ranches, 
where there's heavy cattle grazing that has really destroyed the native landscape, it doesn't come back. They'll just keep taking it down because oftentimes, like at Point Reyes, they simply have too many cattle on the land. It cannot sustain that over 5,000 cattle in that particular area. And so they don't, there's no native plants, so there's no carbon sequestration. There's, they're not taking up carbon. They're not helping fight climate change. That's just irresponsible. I mean, you go out there, it's bone dry. So that means there's no plants above the ground that are native and there's no root structures below the ground. It's all exotics. And again, it's, it's literally just lifeless. So the cattle will take every bit of both native and non-native plants until literally the landscape is barren. And that's what you see at Point Reyes. So actually, it's, got, it's adding to carbon, up, you know, producing more carbon, enhancing climate change. Those are all non-native exotic annual grasses. Maybe a few other plants that are non-native but none of the native plants will come back until you get something like the elk that will help restore those and bring those back, you know, back to the, that area. Yeah, the tule elk e evolved with the native landscape and part of their job is to help maintain and restore the native landscape. So if we remove those non-native exotic cattle from that area, that land will eventually restore itself. It will, take, it will take stages to do that. But the elk moving through it, they'll help bring you know, seeds through, possibly through their hoofs. There's many different hypotheses about how that occur, but we've seen that in other areas. When the cattle are removed, eventually the perennial bunch grasses will come back, the annual grasses, the shrubs. In some areas that we've seen the oaks regenerating and where only the elk are allowed to graze and browse. And it, it, in one of the areas we observed, it was faster than any of us thought it would happen. So it's so devastated right now at Point Reyes, it's gonna take some time for that to occur, but the elk will do the job. There's not a doubt about it. In all my years, over 30 some years of, you know, tracking elk and looking at the different herds, I'm just stunned at how many cattle there are in California. You can drive along any freeway throughout the state and all you see in the landscape is cattle grazed lands. You can, it's almost impossible for the public to see native tule elk. And so in these places like Carrizo Plains National Monument or San Luis Reservoir or Point Reyes National Seashore, we really need to have a place where people can go to see their native endemic tule elk. Because the bottom line is the millions of cattle in the state, that's, you know, I understand that, especially if it's on private lands, but on public lands, it's a different situation. They do not belong on public lands. It's so important for the public and for people to realize that there are three categories of federal lands. There's restricted use lands, moderately restricted use lands, and multiple use lands. National Park Service is in the top category, which are restricted use lands. These are the most protected lands on earth. Point Reyes National Seashore is within that category. They are clearly violating that mission that they established many years ago when that, that place was established. That mission statement says that that land should be restored to its natural processes and landscape, and the tule elk are part of that. So they need to let the tule elk and the other wildlife both the plants and other animals and other organisms, the microorganisms, regenerate and restore that park to what it was meant to be. The ranchers are not part of the natural landscape. So if we want to talk about, you know, ranches have their place. And if you look at the state of California, much of the private public lands in California have cattle, but national parks, again, are the most protected lands on earth. That is not the place. And that's why when they created Point Reyes National Seashore, the plan was to phase out those ranching operations, restore the natural processes and systems that sustain those national parks at Point Reyes National Seashore. And that was the long-term vision. Why that has changed is really unclear. Obviously people are lobbying, but that park was created to eventually phase out those pastoral ranches and lands and allow the natural processes to take over. And we are at that moment in history and the public has clearly spoken out. The majority of what, over 90 some percent of the people that have commented on the general management plan and other, you know, other than now the proposed alternative that they've selected, it's clear that the public supports that becoming a national park with no cattle grazing. It's time for the ranchers to leave. They've had their time. They've been paid millions of dollars and the elk should not be touched or killed to sustain cattle operations that are not sustainable. So California is the only state that has its own subspecies of North American elk, the tule elk. It's a California endemic species found only in California. That means it should have a special status. And that means it should be protected on lands, public lands, especially national park lands. 
And those national park lands are part of the public trust doctrine. Those lands and the elk are held in trust for present and future generations. So the public trust doctrine needs to really be referred to in this situation. Again, it's so critical that this be protected because if those elk aren't protected at Point Reyes National Seashore, again, a national park, restricted use lands that are part of the public trust doctrine, then where will they be protected? We are not guaranteed that we'll have tule elk in California in the next century. I think it's very sad that people would say they don't care about the elk, but the bottom line is most of us do in California care about these elk. And that's why this group of people saved the last 20 elk back in the 1800s. Henry Miller on his ranch protected the last little group of 20 elk and his ranchers literally protect them with guns. And this small group of people formed to protect the elk, reintroduce them into places like Point Reyes National Seashore as a national trust. Again, the public trust doctrine was important in this. They wanted to reestablish these herds for present and future generations. So we have an absolute responsibility to make sure these elk are protected forever. And so people don't get, you know, people can have their opinions, but that doesn't mean that's the right thing to do. These elk have a right to exist. And if we don't, then we're clearly in violation of the public trust doctrine and the right of California citizens to have this native endemic elk. We're in an ecological crisis. We're in a biodiversity crisis and a climate crisis. And the bottom line is these native species are absolutely critical to protect the native landscape, to help sequester carbon, to help restore the native landscape. So people need to understand that this is extremely important. We need to have our tule elk. We need to have our native landscape. And it's absolutely essential that they be protected and for some politician to come in and say, you know, we don't care about the elk or the set, they should be voted out of office, to be honest. It is so important that this is, for this generation coming up, landscape ecology, restoration ecology is taught in almost every college and university now. Young people love this, the movement we've seen at Point Reyes of the young people rising up saying, this is important, this is what we want on our public lands. Those lands belong to them and they're held in trust for them and for future generations. Those people that are supporting these elk being killed on public lands will have to answer to that in their lifetime because these elk belong part of our nat natural ecosystems and especially in our national parks.